Good evening and welcome. Welcome to the University of the Pacific's McGeorge School of Law and our Justices on Justice event. My name is Michael Hunter Schwartz and I'm the Dean of McGeorge and we are thrilled to have you here tonight. We're here this evening to celebrate two important events. The first is the creation of the Anthony M. Kennedy Endowed Chair by the generous Sakopoulos family. And then second, to learn from our distinguished and incredibly impressive panel of jurists. My remarks this evening are gonna focus mostly on that first part, and I'll leave it to the justices to do the second. The creation of the distinguished Kennedy Chair by the Sakopoulos family is an exciting and transformative event. And Mr. and Mrs. Sakopoulos, I cannot thank you enough. This means a lot to us. This is a celebration, your gift is a celebration of the ongoing impact and legacy of, of two Sacramento icons and benefactors, the Sakopoulos family and the Justice and Mary Kennedy. It is a continuo continuation of the Sakopoulos family's long-term history as supporters of the University of the Pacific, of McGeorge, and Sacramento, including loaning us Kiriakos for three years, whom we proudly count among our alumni. Thank you. And the Kennedy Endowed Chair, funded by a $1 million gift and matched dollar for dollar by the University of Pacific's Powell Endowment, creates an important legacy. It will allow McGeorge to attract and retain top faculty members by supporting their research and allowing them to engage in professional travel. It also allows McGeorge to celebrate the more than 40 years that Justice Kennedy has been a towering figure at McGeorge and in Sacramento. Uh, figuratively, I mean, not, I know he's also very tall. <laughs> um, most of all, um, we are thrilled that you have chosen to share the imprimatur of excellence of your family with McGeorge. And that is a very big deal to us, and we're very grateful to you. Thank you so much. I also want to thank Justice Kennedy for lending his name to our new chair, for his uh, longest serving service as a member of the McGeorge faculty, um, his commitment to the rule of law and to civility and to Sacramento, to the thousand and one ways he supported McGeorge. I tell everyone that the only mistake McGeorge made in recruiting me as dean is that they didn't disclose that the job includes the incredible joy of getting to know Justice Kennedy and Mary and work with them to elevate McGeorge. It is great. I'm sorry no one else has it. <laughs> I have only three final matters of business. Uh, first, for those of you watching in classroom C or in our courtroom or at home or anywhere else, we are thankful for your participation and we offer a special thank you to Cogent Legal and its president, McGeorge alumnus Morgan Smith, for donating the technical support to allow us to live cast today's event. I want to make a couple of extra thank yous once again to Mr. Sakopoulos for giving us this reason to celebrate. Um, for endowing uh, McGeorge with this incredible, incredible chair, um, and for giving us a good excuse to organize a nationally and internationally acclaimed panel. I want to give a special Kennedy, thank you to Justice Kennedy for his support for this event, and I want to thank our other panelists, Judge Branstetter, Judge Power, and Justice Grodin for agreeing to participate in today's event. Finally, it's my pleasure and my honor to introduce you to our moderator, my do-it-all and do-it-all excellently colleague, Leslie Jacobs. She is an outstanding scholar who's authored a substantial and important body of scholarship on constitutional issues. 
um, with a particular emphasis on government speech. Her work's been published in law reviews like Yale, Michigan, Illinois, Ohio State, Tulane, and Florida, just to name a few. And in just the last 18 months, she's published three new articles. Um, she is the director of the McGeorge Capital Center, the fourth ranked government law center in the United States. She is an outstanding, oh, you can applaud that if you wish. Um, <laughs> she is an outstanding and committed teacher, and she's a former clerk to the United States Supreme Court Associate Justice Lewis F. Powell. So I think we have a very accomplished and qualified moderator, which tells me that it's my time to leave the podium and turn it over to her. Leslie? Thank you, Dean Schwartz, for the extraordinary introduction. Thank you, Sakopoulos family, uh, for the generous gift that's prompted this evening's event and the university's Powell Fund, which matched it to create such an enormous um, gift to the law school. We appreciate it very much. Thank you, Justices, for making the time to participate in our event. Thanks to everyone here at McGeorge and elsewhere who have worked so hard to make tonight's event a success. And thanks to you, our audience, in the lecture hall, in satellite classrooms, and with us via the internet live stream, for your interest in the content of tonight's program and your openness to listen, consider, and learn from the different perspectives offered by our distinguished justices from across the country and around the world. Before we begin, I will cover a few points of information. Please, during our program, uh, no photos, no audio or video recording, and no use of mobile devices. Please also, at the close of the program, remain seated until the judges have exited the lecture hall. After that, all of you are invited to join us for a reception outside immediately following the close of the program. As to the format, during the first hour of the program, I'll be asking a series of questions. Each of the justices will have an opportunity to respond. During the last part of the program, I will ask the justices questions posed by you. So those of you here tonight um, in the lecture hall, you have car question cards. Please fill them out and pass them to the aisle. And about midway through the program, our ushers, our student ushers, will collect it. Um, those in the satellite classrooms or watching us via live stream can submit questions uh, through the comments function, I'm told. My trusty colleagues, John Sims and Brian Landsberg, are uh, sitting ready, able to review the questions, and they'll select the few that I'm going to be able to present up to the justices tonight. So now we'll turn to the program. I'm charged with the great honor of presenting our four justices to you and the very difficult task of condensing each of their long and extraordinary, extraordinarily impressive biographies into manageable introductions. Please forgive the brevity and turn to your program or to Google uh, for much, much more information. My first introduction is of Associate Justice Anthony M. Kennedy of the United States Supreme Court. Justice Kennedy was appointed by President Ronald Reagan in 1987 and served on the Supreme Court for my entire career as a lawyer and a law professor. His decisions have influenced the laws that we all live by in many different areas and at the federal, state, and local levels. Justice Kennedy, as Dean Schwartz mentioned, is McGeorge's longest serving professor, teaching constitutional law at night on our campus and during the day in our Salzburg summer program. We're so pleased to have him back with us tonight. Judge Ann Power Ford is an international judge, a senior counsel, and an academic. She was elected in 2008 to be the judge in respect of Ireland at the European Court of Human Rights, referred to by those in the know as the Strasbourg Court after the location in that city in France. Working in French and English, she delivered strong and influential opinions on many subjects. But to me, uh, the theme of protecting the rights of children, minorities, and others subject to persecution reverberates uh, through her cases. 
Currently, Judge Power Ford is presiding judge of the Constitutional Court Chamber of the Kosovo Specialist Chambers, located in The Hague. Justice Joseph Grodin has also served as a judge, practicing attorney and academic. He served as Associate Justice of the California Court of Appeal, presiding justice of that court, and as Associate Justice of the California Supreme Court. Justice Grodin was a full-time professor and scholar at UC Hastings College of Law for many years, and is currently a visiting professor at Berkeley Law. Justice Grodin specializes, among other things, on state constitutional law, which I must admit, as a federal constitutional law professor, remains somewhat of a mystery to me. So I'll look forward to being enlightened this evening. Dr. Wolfgang Brandstetter is currently serving as Judge, Constitutional Court of the Republic of Austria, as well as Special Advisor to the Commissioner of Justice of the European Union and Professor of Criminal Law, Vienna University of Economics and Business Administration. He worked for two decades as a criminal defense attorney, during which time he was also engaged in academia, teaching criminal law and heading an academic institute. He served as Minister of Justice for the Republic of Austria, which sounds to me like it's roughly equivalent to our position of Attorney General, um, who heads the entire Federal uh, Department of Justice. And he was also the country's 2017 Vice Chancellor. Thanks to all four of you for being with us this evening. I'll now, to, I'll now turn to our first question, with Justice Kennedy being the first one to respond. The four of you hail from high courts from across the country and around the world. We all know some things about your courts, but perhaps not as much as would be optimal to engage with tonight's program. To begin our comparative conversation, a brief overview of your courts would be helpful their locations, memberships, responsibilities, and operations. What features distinguish the type of cases your court decides, the ways that your court operates, and the scope of its authority from the others represented here tonight? And in what ways are they the same? Justice Kennedy? Well, thank you so much, Professor. Uh, the one thing they didn't tell me is how to work this microphone. <laughs> oh, it was on. Yeah, uh, I think uh, you're good. Oh, it's on. All right. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, it would be remiss of me. Uh, not to begin by acknowledging um, how grateful uh, this school is, how grateful this community must be, how grateful all members of the legal profession must be for the support of Angelo Sakopoulos and his wife Sophia and the Sakopoulos family in giving this magnificent gift to McGeorge. Angelo knew Dean Gordon Shaver. Gordon Shaver talked contracts and it was part of Gordon's lifestyle, it was, it was part of his belief that you gave more than you had to give as part of your bargain, and Angelo understands that. In this city, we see uh, physical manifestations of the law, and when you see the Capitol, you see court buildings and so forth, but we must be interested not just in the reality, but, but the idea. And McGeorge is very, very important in Dean Sacramento's law school. Sacramento Law School in the middle of the place where law is made and where law is followed, and where law produces real results. Um, and Angelo, the um, uh, Ar Aristotle uh, wrote in his uh, aesthetics, uh, he gave some advice to playwrights, but it applies to judges and to lawyers as well. He told playwrights you can write about what was, what is, and what ought to be. Lawyers always must find out what was. What's our history? Why are we here? What's the meaning of the Constitution? What's our heritage? How do we keep it? What is? What is the current state of our, of, of our democracy, of our polis? And what ought it to be? And those questions are the ones that this school must always ask. And by endowing a professorship in my name, uh, please understand that you and I probably both agree uh, that this is designed to tell members of the bar, to tell members of our entire profession that they are welcome to come here to make George part time uh, because all of us, all of us have, have the duty to know and to understand and to protect that law and what you have done here will 
be a, a, a gift to future generations. Thank you very much. Now you'd like to hear about our court. <laughs> um, uh, we, uh, as my uh, panel members, uh, around the world, one way that uh, parliaments or legislators control courts, because parliaments and legislators don't particularly like courts, is to give them too much work. Uh, if you, you can bury a court and make it ineffective by giving it too much work. Some years ago, the, in, the Supreme Court of India had a, a backlog uh, a, 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 a judge, you may remember, of, of 50,000 cases. It, just, it made it ineffective. Uh, our court chooses the case that it uh, should hear. We see cases where we think the result is wrong, but we let it go, uh, because if there's another court after us, they would say we were wrong too. This could go on forever. Um, so we limit uh, the cases we take to cases first where the courts of appeals are divided, uh, where the profession is spending time arguing on an issue and courts have reached different conclusions, uh, or we wait until there's a federal statute that's been declared unconstitutional, or we wait until there's a, a major public emergency that, that, requires, that requires our intervention. Uh, every uh, year, about 8,000 petitions, called petitions for certiorari, are filed asking, please take this case. Uh, and the 8,000 petitions, the judges read, it's like doing push-ups, you read so many every morning. Uh, and uh, you, all you need to do is make a little mark. And if you make that little mark on the petition, then all of the nine justices must discuss it. And we have conferences throughout the term, October through June, do we take this case? And any one justice can ask that it be discussed, and all nine justices then discuss whether it should be taken. Uh, from the 8,000 or so petitions, we'd make little marks on about 500 of them, so we discuss about 500 a year. And from those 500, we take anywhere from 70 to, 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 a, to 100. And that's how we control, and that's how we control our workload. Uh, then the briefing begins, uh, and the briefs are, are, are public. Uh, the briefs are scholarly uh, and, and, and well-written. Although I must say I've never read a brief in 43 years that I couldn't put down in the middle, but other than that, <laughs> uh, um, uh, uh, that's, that's, the, the briefing begins and, and, and we work with our law clerks. We have four law clerks and uh, I uh, uh, tell my law clerks uh, the, they take a quarter of the cases. <clears throat> I, I one, one time was in uh, uh, Alabama when I was, uh, the circuit judge for the 11th circuit and uh, I was meeting with the lawyers and the judges from the circuit and I said well now my clerks read a fourth of the race so I have to read them all and uh, sometimes there's a very difficult uh, set of briefs and I'll read them a second time the weekend before the oral argument and I like music in the background and I play opera and I have what I call one opera and two opera briefs. <laughs> well uh, this was a Saturday, they were dressed to play golf or tennis, and they were too polite to roll their eyes, but uh, I knew that uh, this, this sounded what pretentious, highfalutin, this guy from the East talking about the opera. And so I said, oh, I said, oh I've lost this audience. But I, I, I got saved because an attorney raised his hand, he said, well, I've got a rule like that when I read those, when I write those briefs. I said, oh? He said, yeah, I have a one six-pack brief and a two six-pack brief. <laughs> I, I, I said, I remember your last brief. I think it was a three six pack brief. <laughs> uh, so anyway, the briefs come and, and we're, we're very well prepared. Uh, and some of the European justice uh, courts, as, as you probably know, uh, Judge Groden, and I'm sure as you know, doctor, uh, and, and, and you can correct me, uh, uh, Judge Power Ford, but uh, in, in, in England, they're, they spend more time with the attorneys in the oral argument learning about the case. We learn about the case before we go on the bench for the briefs. Uh, we have a rule, we do not discuss the case with each other uh, until after the oral argument. So I prepare the briefs uh, and we do not talk with other judges because we don't want what little cliques or cabals. Uh, so then we have oral argument, and the first time it would be as if we're sitting here, uh, and each uh, justice can ask a question. 
the first time I have any, in, or we have any indication of how a judge might be thinking about the case, what problems the justice sees, is from the questions. And a good oral argument is often a conversation the judges are asking among themselves. I'll ask a question of the attorney, I said, well, well, isn't it true? And I'm really saying, and listen, Dr. Banstetter, I'm really interested in this issue. And then he'll say, but isn't it true that? And he'll say, not so fast, Kennedy, I'm interested in it. So, so this, this is the, an oral argument dynamic. And it's the first time we've ever discussed the case with each other in the oral argument session. And sometimes we behave rather badly, interrupt each other and so forth. Um, and sometimes the argument, you know, it's like a, like a class, Dean. Some classes are good, some are not so good, some are flat, some are not, you know. Um, after the oral argument, we then have conference. Uh, we have a double door, a, 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 a little vestibule, uh, so you have to have, go through two doors to get in our conference room. It's just to remind us that what we say is confidential. There's just the nine of us. And uh, the uh, senior, uh, the, the chief justice speaks first, and then the most senior justice goes down to the last judge. And I liked it as a junior justice. I was the last to speak. And if it was 4-4, I could kind of have the suspense come out a little bit. <laughs> uh, and, they, and they would listen to it. But um, our, 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 our conferences, are, one reason they're confidential is so that you can try out certain ideas so that you can uh, um, maybe uh, make a suggestion that you're not even sure will work and get your colleagues. So, the so this is a very productive uh, uh, exercise. And our, and our present, uh, Justice Rehnquist was very strict. Uh, we would go down in order of seniority and then that, that would be it. Um, Chief Justice Roberts uh, uh, likes us to engage. We, we don't interrupt each other. The, the senior speaks first, then the, then the next most senior. No interruption. But then after that's over, people ask each other questions and so forth. And it's a really, it's a really wonderful dynamic. Then comes the opinion writing. You're assigned, the, the, the Chief Justice uh, assigns the opinion if, uh, to the majority if he's in the majority, or the dissent if he's in the dissent. The next, uh, the, and the senior justice in the dissent of the majority assigns it. Uh, and we try to keep the workload even. We don't want to give the railroad reorganization cases all to one justice. Uh, and, uh, and we like to keep the workload even, so we assign the case. And then you sit down and you write. And those of you who are students, you know, uh, all of us know, you, you write on your yellow pad or the internet, and what, the first thing you write is a piece of junk, and it goes in the wastebasket, uh, because you're thinking. Uh, and so uh, you write this opinion, and you send it around to the other judge. And again, um, no, no discussion. We, we, sometimes Justice Breyer was right next to me, and I, well, one of us would see uh, a little technical problem in the case, and so we'd talk about it, and then we'd immediately send a memo to our colleagues. Uh, Stephen has talked with me about this problem, and we just thought you want to know just because we don't want any private conversation. So anyway, the opinion goes out that you've written, and then you wait to see what happens. Justice Brennan one time had his clerks come, our clerks come in July, and uh, uh, Brennan got back uh, in, in August on his vacation to meet his clerk. He said, what's the single most important word for you to remember while you're here at the court? And then somebody said, liberty, justice, freedom, equal protection. He said, no, no, five. It takes five votes to do anything around here. <laughs> um, so you circulate this opinion and, you're what, and you want to get the, the five vote. Then the returns come in. Somebody said, well, um, my vote was with you at conference, but now it, it seems to me there's a certain problem with this section and my decision is to wait for the dissent. And you say, oh, no. So then the dissent comes around. And sometimes the, the court switches, uh, sometimes you think you were in the dissent, but you're really in the majority, or vice versa. Um, and uh, we, we do try to get five to give uh, guidance to the system. Uh, and in appellate writing, you have to make the decision. If you write very specifically just about this case, then it doesn't give any guidance. If you write in broad general terms, you're probably going to be wrong. So you have to uh, find, find the middle balance. And that's the opinion. Once the opinion is out, uh, we're the, uh, oh, incidentally, we get all of our work done by June 30 every year. We're the only branch of the government that gets our work done on time. Thank you very much. 
Um, we, um, all of the opinions are released by June 30. Uh, we give reasons for what we do. Uh, those reasons are designed to compel allegiance, to compel respect for what we've done. Uh, sometimes people say that our court is anti-majoritarian, um, but, uh, and, and, that, and that's true in the short term, but uh, it's my, um, my, my belief that we're majoritarian in the long term, and the long term people understand the reasons for what we do, and that's, that's how the law works, because uh, the law must command uh, the, the respect of the citizens or we do not have the rule of law. Thank that you so much. It was a little long, I'm sorry, but <laughs> you can afford Judge my Power Ford. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Professor um, Jacobson. Thank you indeed uh, to, to the McGregor, McGeorge School of Law, I should say, for the invitation to participate here today. The court on which I had the privilege to sit was, um, as Professor Jacobs said, the European Court of Human Rights and it is located in Strasbourg, France, France, which is just on the border between France and Germany. And that actually proves to be uh, quite, quite symbolic in many ways because the court was established after the Second World War. And I'll speak a little bit about that later. Its membership is comprised of 47 judges, one judge from every country in Europe. That is from Iceland to Azerbaijan. Every country bar one, Belarus, is represented on the court and judges when they are elected, they are not elected to represent their individual countries but they are now once elected European judges and their obligation is to ensure uh, that the European Convention on Human Rights um, is, is essentially observed throughout every member state. The responsibilities of the Strasbourg Court uh, primarily are to ensure that the um, fundamental human rights which are set out in the convention are observed uh, in each member state as I said. After the Second World War 10 countries of Europe came together and essentially agreed that never again would any state be entitled to do what the German state did to its citizens and the, indeed to those uh, beyond uh, citizenship but who were within the jurisdiction. And that sense of never again really continues to drive the court because each member state, without loss of sovereignty, nevertheless agrees to subject itself to international scrutiny. Never again would a state be entitled to treat its citizens in a manner which evaded uh, international supervision. And essentially the Strasbourg Court, it's not a court of appeal, but it is a supervisory court. It reviews the judgments of the domestic courts of any particular state that appears before it, and it determines whether or not the final judgments of those court, uh, courts were sufficient to respect and vindicate the fundamental rights protected in the Convention. The court operates um, in a number of ways. It delivers decisions on inadmissibility, and you can imagine with 800 million people within the jurisdiction of the court, uh, there is a huge uh, number of applications every year from individuals who feel aggrieved that their state has failed to vindicate their, their human rights. You can have anything from the most serious cases of torture or disappearances right down to an individual who feels that he didn't get a fair trial when he got a speeding ticket and yeah, he wants to come to Strasbourg to complain, again, to complain about it. So you can imagine you know, what, what's involved in sorting through all of those applications. So the vast majority of um, rulings of the court are decisions on inadmissibility. And sometimes there is a decision on, in, on admissibility and there will be a vote and the case will either go forward to be judged on its merits if the judges con consider that it's admissible and if it's inadmissible, it will, be, it will be dismissed. When a case goes forward for judgment on the merits, the vast majority of judgments are handed down by chambers, sections of the court and each chamber is comprised of seven judges. The chambers are representing various geographical locations, so there's an attempt to have a mix of locations of <coughs> countries within a chamber, and also different legal systems. Some judges come from the common law system, like Ireland, others come from the civil law jurisdiction. Um, so there's an attempt to mix the, to mix the various legal systems. Mm -hmm. And decision, judgments of the court then are voted on by the seven. If a, if a judge wishes to file a dissenting opinion, he or she is free to do so, 
And I think dissenting opinions can play a very important part of the, uh, of the function of a court, an international court, because by filing a dissenting opinion, a judge will usually be attempting to flag to other colleagues that this is an important case and an important matter of interpretation or application of the convention arises. When the decision is, when the judgment is then delivered, the parties have three months within which to apply for a referral of the case to the grand chamber. Usually the losing party obviously wants to have a second, uh, wants the court to take a se second look at it. And the grand chamber is comprised of 17 judges from across Europe. And those 17 judges will come together to, to read the chamber judgment uh, and to consider, to consider the arguments of the parties. Um, Usually, in whether it's chamber or grand chamber, a case will be allocated to a judge rapporteur, and that judge rapporteur, in consultation with the registry staff, will prepare a first draft. So if a lawyer brings me a case, I will read the papers, I will discuss the case with the lawyer, and then I will give an indication as to how I think that case should be decided. And on the basis of those instructions, the lawyer will draft a proposed um, decision or judgment. Um, that proposal is then brought to the chamber or the committee of three judges depending on the formation and the chamber will discuss the proposal and then if judges disagree with it um, they, will, they will indicate their disagreement with the proposal and set out the reasons why. I very much liked um, what Justice Kennedy said about in, in the US Supreme Court whereby judges don't discuss the case beforehand. Um, I think informal conversations do occur on some, on some courts um, and having heard you, Justice Kennedy, I think it's a good idea that people remain silent until the matter is actually before the court. That said, depending on the case and people being what they are, it was usually possible to kind of have a, have a hunch as to how a particular judge may, may consider a particular argument. Um, the types of cases, the court deals with all human rights abuses. So from the right to life, the prohibition on torture, the prohibition on human trafficking or forced labor, the right to liberty, so forth, the right to free expression, privacy, and so on. So although it's a human rights court and dealing only with human rights cases, it actually deals with any issue that comes before the domestic courts, including commercial cases, because Article 6 of the Convention guarantees the right to a fair trial. So in reality, anybody who's aggrieved by the fairness of his or her trial at domestic level, whatever that trial was about, civil or criminal, can bring an application to the Strasbourg Court complaining of a breach of Article 6. Um, the scope of its authority, I suppose its nearest comparator would be the US Supreme Court in that it is the final authority in Europe on the question of how the European Convention, the Constitution in your country, and how the European Convention <coughs> is to be interpreted and applied throughout Europe. It sets, I should say, the minimum standards. There's nothing to prevent a country from enhancing human rights protection for its individuals, but the court sets down the minimum standards which must be observed uh, in every country that has ratified the convention because at the end of the day each state has agreed to guarantee to its citizens and to those that come within its jurisdiction the rights and freedoms set forth in the convention. I'll finish on a note of differences between our court and the, Stra and, and the US court and I, I would say two. Firstly there is the right to individual petition so unlike the US Supreme Court the Strasbourg court judges don't get to pick and choose which cases they will deal with. Now, in reality, of course, because of the volume of applications coming before the court, um, a lot of them are sifted out as inadmissible. But once a case is admissible, then it goes forward for a decision on its merits. Um, the second difference, I suppose, would be on the terms of office. A judge of the Strasbourg Court is appointed for nine years non-renewable. Originally, we had a system whereby judges could have their term renewed after six years, but that depended on their country nominating them once again to serve on the court. And of course, if I bring in a judgment, which the Irish government didn't like, I'd obviously, um, indirectly, some people would say, there could, be, there could be pressure on a judge. So I'm very happy to see that the system changed uh, in 2009 under, under um, Protocol 14, whereby now judges are appointed once for a nine-year term. I think I leave it at that, and I'd be very interested to hear from the other judges on the same question. Well, first, I want to thank the Dean uh, for the invitation to be here and to participate. It's a great honor to participate with uh, such great jurists from around the world. Um, the California Supreme Court, on which I served, uh, is different in some respects and similar in others to both uh, Justice Kennedy's court and Judge 
uh, power forwards court. One difference that strikes me, although it's fairly trivial, is this. The California Constitution contains a provision that says that the judges must decide the case, each case within 90 days from the time that it is submitted for decision or they don't get paid. <laughs> <laughs> for many years, including the years I was on the court, the Supreme Court interpreted that provision to mean that a case was not submitted until the Supreme Court said it was, <laughs> and the Supreme Court didn't say it was until they were ready to file an opinion. And that, that situation <laughs> continued down. until after I left the court, and until some lawyer, I think from Sacramento, I'm not sure, uh, <laughs> sued the court and the controller, the state controller, uh, to stop payment uh, for, for each of the justices uh, because the court never got an opinion out within 90 days of oral argument and uh, asked that their salaries be stopped. And the Supreme Court settled the case <laughs> uh, <laughs> as good courts will do. Uh, by agreeing that a case would be deemed submitted at the time of oral argument unless time for briefing was extended. So that has this peculiar consequence that the Supreme Court has seven justices. They're each going to weigh in on the opinion um, 90 days from uh, the time of oral argument is a very short time yeah. in which to get out an opinion if you're getting out an opinion, opinions in a substantial number of cases. So the current California Supreme Court's practice uh, is to circulate a memo in advance of oral argument, which is in reality a proposed opinion. And the other justices weigh in, either with concurrences or proposed dissents, before oral argument ever takes place. Now, if you had a current member of the court here instead of me, I would bet you that they would assure you that minds are not made up uh, by the time of oral argument, that oral argument is very important still, and you can judge that for yourself, but it's a, it's yeah. a different, I, I think it's, uh, I think it's a, not such a great procedure. Um, there are other differences. For example, uh, <coughs> justices on most state appellate and Supreme Courts uh, are elected in one way or another. Uh, and they serve for uh, a, a term and then their names appear on the ballot. <coughs> Uh, in a so-called retention election, and people vote yes or no. Uh, I had the unfortunate experience of being on the court for the first time uh, when, when justices who were actually removed from the court through a retention election. Uh, Rose Byrd was the chief justice at the time, uh, Cruz Reynoso and myself, all three of us. Uh, were discarded by the electorate in a campaign which focused uh, on the death penalty. Uh, uh, the campaign against us was that we were insufficiently enthusiastic about the death penalty. Um, and uh, since then there have been no judges removed, but there have been uh, campaigns and, there have been, and their judges have been removed in other states from state supreme courts in campaigns that focused on the death penalty or more recently on same-sex marriage or on some other issue. Uh, uh, I'm supposed to say that, uh, that uh, elections are, are part of the process uh, and, and uh, judges welcome them. In fact, that's not true. Uh, <laughs> and I, if, if it were possible to change that procedure, I would certainly support uh, changing it, but I think it's very unlikely. Uh, 
state, state Supreme Court uh, is uh, uh, not a national court like Justice Kennedy's court uh, or like uh, Justice Branstetter's court, uh, nor is it a supranational court as the case of Judge Power Ford, but it is a subnational court, uh, which means that it, it, its authority is a bit more modest. Um, California has its own constitution. Every state has its constitution. And you may be surprised to learn that state constitutions existed before the federal constitution. Uh, the California constitution was patterned after the Constitution of Iowa, which was in turn patterned after the Constitution of Virginia, which was adopted, I think, in 1775 or thereabouts. Uh, so it is possible for state constitutions to differ from the federal constitution in the provisions which bear upon the protection of individual rights. We have in California uh, Article I uh, which, which uh, is somewhat similar to the Bill of Rights, but it is different in certain respects. It has certain rights uh, which are not contained in the federal constitution, or at least not explicitly, for example, an explicit right to privacy. It has other provisions which are phrased differently. And even when they're phrased in exactly the same way, uh, the California court feels quite free uh, to give an independent interpretation uh, to the California Constitution. It will give due consideration to the decisions of the uh, United States Supreme Court. It will give due consideration to decisions of other state courts. And as we will discuss later, it will actually give due consideration to opinions of international tribunals. But uh, the California Supreme Court is the last word on what the state constitution means, and the United States Supreme Court will defer uh, to that interpretation and will not review uh, the decision unless it conflicts with some provision in the federal constitution. And let me just give you an example of that, and, and then I'll conclude. Uh, a California statute uh, said, as many statutes did used to say that marriage is between a man and a woman. And uh, that statute was challenged under the California Constitution. Uh, and the California Supreme Court decided, as a matter of state constitutional law, uh, that a ban on same sex marriage violated the state constitutional equivalence of the Due Process Clause and the Equal Protection Clause. That decision was then overturned by an initiative measure in California because in those states which have direct democracy provisions in their constitution, uh, decisions of the court can, can be uh, excuse me, provisions of the Constitution can be modified in the case of California by a simple majority vote. Uh, in other states, usually uh, there is a supermajority requirement or it has to be adopted uh, in two successive elections or make it a little more difficult uh, than, than simply half of the people plus <coughs> one. But that's what we have in California. So the California Supreme Court decision in that same-sex marriage case uh, was, in effect, overruled uh, not by the Supreme Court, but by the people through the exercise of the initiative. Then another case went to the Supreme Court uh, involving a similar question in four other states. and. Uh, the United States Supreme Court, and what I have to say is a truly beautiful opinion by Justice Kennedy and, and, and a piece of, of uh, legal literature, uh, almost, uh, almost poetic 
as some of its uh, portions, but nevertheless uh, rigor rigorously reasoned, uh, decided that as a matter of the federal constitution, uh, same-sex marriage could not be prohibited. So that's, a, that's an example of how the state constitution and the federal constitution uh, work together in a federal system. Let, let me just say, uh, Justice Grodin, you're a marvelous example that from a temporary and bitter defeat, uh, there can be great victory. And the distinguished service you've given to the profession, your writing, your teaching after leaving the court are a tribute to you and a tribute to the law that you love. Thank you for your career. Very kind. Dr. Brandstetter. Well, first off, let me say that uh, I'm truly thankful for this generous invitation by the McGeorge School of Law here in Sacramento. It is a great honor and pleasure for me to be here representing the Austrian Constitutional Court, which is bound by the same European law system as most of the other Supreme Courts in continental Europe. So, what I say about our constitutional court is basically also valid for the constitutional courts of all member states of the European Union. And uh, I want to mention that it's a great honor and pleasure for me to meet uh, Justice Kennedy for the first time. Uh, Justice Kennedy, we all know that your name always has been very popular in uh, Europe, but uh, you have become even more popular during the last weeks for some reasons in a positive sense. <laughs> I just wanted to mention it. So before giving you a brief overview of our CURT, its responsibility, duties, and operations, I would like to mention that the Austrian constitutional CURT dates back to 1920 and was the first of its kind in Europe. The constitution that made this possible was at least strongly influenced probably created by a world-famous man of legal science, Mr. Hans Kelsen, who had to leave Europe in 1940 because of his Jewish roots. He found a new home, scientifically and personally, here in California at the University of Berkeley, where he became a distinguished and very, very respected professor of law, and where he died in 1973. And he's still very honored in Austria. Mentioning Facts like this is not only building bridges between Austria and California, beyond Arnold Schwarzenegger, but, <laughs> but it also tells the cruel story of the last century. And keeping this in mind, it is easier to understand how important constitutional law in general and the rule of law in particular are as a guarantee of a peaceful life in society on the basis of respected fundamental rights for everyone. It was Hans Kelsen who once said that the Constitution without a constitutional court is like a lantern without a light in it. So it's up to the churches of the Supreme Courts to enlighten the path to justice. And this path sometimes causes areas of strong or even stormy political demands. I can only speak for Austria and the similar courts in Central Europe, but this phenomenon seems to be a worldwide one. Since I was a politician myself, serving as a Minister of Justice for four years, I can understand the point of view of politicians. From a politician's perspective, the Constitutional or the Supreme Court can be compared to a red traffic light during the rush hour when you're in a hurry anyway. <laughs> But nevertheless, you have to say stop and show the red light. That's exactly what Supreme Courts stand for. And for us in Central Europe, this is easier than for you in the United States, since the constitutional Supreme Courts in the member states of the European Union, they have an institution, a highest court above them, that can show them red lights too. In particular, the European Court in Luxembourg which is the highest court for all member states of the European Union regarding European law and, most important, the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg, whose decisions 
are binding for all the member states of the European Convention on Human Rights. And this is also valid, also the case for a number of countries beyond the European Union. This is important, and it, including the states of the Balkan area, Ukraine, Georgia, and even Turkey and Russia, for instance. In Austria, we have a special situation since the European Convention on Human Rights has been granted the rank of constitutional law by constitutional order already in 1964. Therefore, the European Convention on Human Rights is equal in status to other national fundamental rights and is directly applicable constitutional law in Austria. And moreover, the referendum of 1994 provided the basis for a federal constitutional law on Austria's accession to the European Union, which required a total reform of the Austrian constitution and authorized the relevant bodies responsible under constitutional law to conclude the state treaty on Austria's succession to the European Union. And in brief, through this constitutional enabling and opening clause, union law was put on a level equivalent to national law in Austria, which implies in particular the special significance of the jurisprudence of the Court of Justice of the European Union for the interpretation and application of union law. Hence, the jurisprudence of the highest courts in Austria, including our constitutional court, acknowledges the principle of primacy of union law over national law. So this is the legal framework for our constitutional court, the legal framework that is to a large extent uh, determined by European law. And how do we work in practice? Well, we are 14 judges in the constitutional court, uh, including the president who has no vote. So certain judges have to decide. And usually we get a written proposal from one of us. And we have assistants who prepare these uh, proposals. And then we discuss the proposals among us. Usually uh, the other judges agree to a proposal, but uh, it's not always the case, no. Sometimes even the result is different from the proposal that came from one of uh, our colleagues. And uh, we do not have, this is another difference, we do not have dissenting votes. Um, according to our constitution, uh, dissenting votes are not possible. Uh, well, we think that dissenting votes would uh, somehow undermine the authority of the court as such, so that's why uh, they are not uh, possible in Austria. So this is how we work, and uh, basically I can say that uh, the, the issues we, we deal with, they are quite the same, uh, you have to deal with two, but uh, that's the next question. Mm -hmm. Con okay, thank you so much. Con oh. Constitutions last uh, only so long as they have the support and the, and the reverence of their people. Uh, Dr. Branstetter has just mentioned uh, Hans Kelsen, he wrote the Constitution for Austria after the First World War, um, but then the people didn't care about that Constitution, and he himself had to leave Austria, went to the University of California at Berkeley. When I was studying uh, political theory, I went to see him. I was at Stanford, but he was gracious to meet me when he was a professor at Cal, and I thought, well, I spent 10 minutes with him, and he was so gracious. and. Uh, uh, because of some of his guidance, that's why I continue to study political theory. He, he was wonderful. But uh, in all of our courts, we have to make sure that the people understand that the Constitution and the law have meaning for us in our own time. And I'm just curious to know, and I, I, I don't want to take over your, your question, but I've, uh, uh, the, the, does the European Court of, of Human Rights in, in Strasbourg um, uh, do you think that the Europeans are reading their opinions and, are, and, and as a result are having more loyalty to the European Convention on Human Rights? I think it's mixed depending on the, on the countries. Some countries with a long tradition for human rights protection um, probably didn't give the Convention as much, as much weight as they might have done. I'm thinking of Ireland, for example, we have fundamental protections uh, of human rights going back to 1922. So when I was a barrister, 
Um, if somebody pleaded a case under the Convention, it was kind of, oh my God, they've nothing else to say because, you know, if you can't win your case on the Constitution and you have to depend on the Convention, it kind of flagged a, maybe a weak case. But that certainly is changing, I think, today. Um, because it's now 15 years since the European Court of Human Rights, since the Convention was given um, more effect in, in Ireland. And certainly if you look at the concept of family under the Irish Constitution, family was the family founded on marriage, which obviously now has changed under the Convention. Um, so, so I think it's, it depends on the country. Say for some emerging democracies or restored democracies, they very much depend upon the judgments of the courts to send signals to their own governments as to how human rights uh, must be vindicated. So it very much depends. Thank you so much. I'll point out that we are halfway through the program, and so for those of you with question cards, please make sure that you do pass them to the aisle. We'll have the ushers coming through soon uh, to take those and deliver them to uh, our professors here who, who will review them. And so uh, while we do that and wait for the audience questions, uh, we'll have one more question to ask of the justices. And we'll start with um, Justice Power Ford here. Um, and what we're going to ask about, I thought that it would make sense for each of you uh, to talk about a, a primary responsibility of your courts is to interpret the meaning of individual rights such as liberty, equality, dignity, free speech. Would make sense, maybe perhaps what you could do is take uh, the time that you have to tell us what you think is most important and will be most interesting to us to learn about your court's interpretation of those rights. Yes, uh, thank you. Liberty, of course, is protected under Article 5 of the Convention, and the court takes that very seriously. It has a very strict interpretation of the circumstances under which a person can be deprived of his or her liberty. Um, I suppose the recollection of the knock on the door coming at midnight and the uh, Gestapo or the secret police taking people away, uh, that was very much part of the memory of, of, of the European psyche. So the protection of liberty um, is, is treated very ser seriously by the court and it's subject to the most careful scrutiny. And the court has confirmed time and again that those who are deprived of their liberty are in a very vulnerable position and states have a duty to protect them. It has been applied in lots of different contexts, obviously prisons and detention centres, but also where mentally ill patients have been detained in hospitals. It's been also interpreted in the context of somebody who's trapped in crowd control for the day and they can't move um, because they're corralled. So liberty is, is a very serious, uh, seriously protected under the Convention. We don't have an equality provision per se, the right to equality, but under the Convention, under Article 14, there is the right not to be discriminated against on, the, on various grounds such as sexual orientation, religion, race and so forth. And the Court has ruled in a number of cases um, what, what that provision means. Um, Dignity, I don't see as a right. It's mentioned in the preamble to the Convention, but I don't consider dignity as a right. Uh, to my mind, dignity is a reality that grounds all fundamental human rights. It's because you are human, you are of value. Uh, because you are human, you have dignity, and that is why rights inhere in us as individuals, and the state's duty is to respect those rights, and where it does interfere with them or curtail them in some way, it must meet uh, rigorous standards in terms of justification. I suppose for me the greatest area of contrast between the European system and say the American system has been on the question of the treatment of prisoners. A long time ago in Searing versus the United Kingdom, the Strasbourg Court found that it would violate Article 3 of the Convention to extradite Mr. Searing to the US. He'd been accused of murdering, um, I think, his girlfriend's parents, and the court understood that if convicted, he had the possibility of spending his, uh, of the death sentence and obviously spending time on death row. And the court found it would violate Article 3, the prohibition on torture and inhuman and degrading treatment. It would violate that provision if Mr. Searing were to spend years waiting on death row, not knowing of uh, what was to become. So that was an early case. But last, in, in the last couple of years, it delivered a very important judgment called Vinter and the United, versus the United Kingdom. Mr. Vinter and his co-applicants were very serious criminals. They had been convicted of the most heinous of crimes and they uh, were subjected to whole life sentences under the UK-British system. Under the UK law, you could have a, a life imprisonment sentence, which was reducible and, you know, after, after a certain period of time, but you also had under the law whole life orders, which meant that at the time of sentencing, the judge could say, this offence is so egregious, you must spend the rest of your life in prison and you may never be released. 
Mr. Winter and his co-applicants were the subject of whole life orders, and they came to Strasbourg saying that deprived them of uh, their right not to be treated in an inhuman and degrading manner. It was a difficult case for the court, and the court found, it went to the Grand Chamber, and the court found that it did indeed violate Article 3 of the Convention to sentence somebody to life without parole forever, with no possibility. It said it would be capricious to expect a prisoner to work towards his own rehabilitation or her own rehabilitation without knowing when, at some future date, there might be a mechanism introduced which could allow them to be released. And I put in a very short concurring opinion in that case, explaining in two paragraphs why I agreed with the court's judgment, because it was difficult. I thought of the victims of Mr. Vinter and his co-accused and the horrendous pain that he had inflicted upon them. I thought of the victims' families and the lifelong suffering uh, to which they were subjected because of Mr. Vinter's activities. But I thought of Mr. Vinter and his co-accused, his co-convicted, in prison for life. And for me, I, I suppose I, I, would, I, would, I, would, I, was, I was explaining that no matter how egregious the wrongs that a person may have committed, that person retains his basic humanity. And part of humanity, part of what it means to be a human being, mm -hmm. is to have the capacity to change, is to have the capacity to hope that one day a person may have atoned for the wrongs that he or she has done. And I have to say, I was uh, thinking about the film Shawshank Redemption, I'm sure you're familiar with it, <laughs> where, you know, Red goes in before the parole committee time and time again, and yes, I've been re rehabilitated and still it's rejected, until finally he goes in and he's asked, you know, he doesn't want to play the game anymore. And he says, do you want to know, am I sorry for what I did? And the parole officer asks, well, are you? And he says, there's not a day goes by that I don't think of what I did. I want to talk to that stupid 16-year-old kid, and I want to tell him how life is. But he says, I can't do that. And all I've got left is this old man. So, you know, I think it is possible that human beings can change, can come to understand the nature of what they have done and can seek to atone for the wrongs that they have committed. And if after 40 years, a person has rehabilitated himself or herself and has shown genuine remorse and atonement, I think, I think it is an affront to that person's dignity to say you may never ever hope that you may someday be reintegrated into society. So that short opinion on the right to hope, um, it, it, it explained my position, and the judgment went on to have an effect on other uh, decisions of the court, whereby the court refused to extradite uh, prisoners with mental health problems to the US, where they were suspected of having committed terrorist offenses, and if convicted, could spend their lives in the supermax facilities, the high, high controlled facilities. Uh, the court found to do that in certain circumstances could violate Article 3. So I'm, I'm, I'm kind of compressing what I want to I say, but I think that's, uh, it's in the area of the treatment of prisoners that um, I think our court has made a significant contribution to human rights protection. Thank you so much. Justice Gordon. Well, first, I don't want to be upstaged about Justice Kelson. I had Justice, uh, I mean, uh, Professor Kelson. I had Hans Kelson as a professor uh, in a course in international law at the University of California. What was the course? In, 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 in what? What subject? International law. In international. And I remember the first class, uh, Kelson stood up there and he said, there are various theories of international law. There is so-and-so's theory and there is the, another theory, he says, we will study Kelson's theory. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we study. Uh, Kelson uh, was a legal positivist, uh, meaning that he viewed the law as a, 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 a rational system uh, based upon certain principles of process which gave legitimacy to laws. Uh, and uh, the legal positivists did not focus so much upon uh, what they would regard as moral questions. Uh, it, it was part of our American constitutional history that the Constitution is phrased in 
broad general terms which incorporate concepts such as liberty and due process of law. Uh, and these were not given definition by the framers. Uh, they were left to be developed through the process of adjudication over time. And that has resulted in a certain flexibility. Some, some would argue too much flexibility, but a certain flexibility uh, in the development of constitutional doctrine. And the Constitution has changed. I mean, the, the, the federal Constitution changed dramatically uh, after the Civil War when the concept of equality was first introduced. When the con federal Constitution was adopted, not only did it not mention anything about equality, but it also uh, gave at least tentative approval to the institution of slavery. So things have changed over time, and they've changed, I think, uh, in, in a direction which is significant for the nature of this panel. And that is, uh, they've changed uh, in the direction of considering how human rights are treated around the world. Uh, the United States, at least in its legal system, is not as insular as it once was. Uh, so, for example, uh, with respect to the rights of prisoners, uh, a friend of mine who was on the Supreme Court of Oregon by the name of Hans Lindy, uh, mm -hmm. back in 1981, wrote an opinion in a case called Sterling Against Cup, in which the question was whether uh, the practice of body searches, uh, including of prisoners, including uh, sexually intimate area, areas by officers of the opposite sex, uh, violated the Oregon Constitution. And Lindy said in that opinion, um, referring to the principles of privacy and dignity, which he found implicit in the Oregon Constitution. He said, indeed, the same principles have been a worldwide concern recognized by the United Nations and other in multinational bodies. The various formulations in these different sources in themselves are not constitutional law. We cite them here as contemporary expressions of the same concern with minimizing needlessly harsh, degrading, or dehumanizing treatment of prisoners that is expressed in our Constitution. Um, so I think there's been a, a, a convergence uh, uh, around certain principles of human rights uh, in which there is respect for the decisions of other tribunals, including tribunals from other countries. Uh, and. Uh, I, th I think that's one of the most imper important characteristics of our, of our rule of law today. Dr. Brownstetter. <laughs> I'm uh, very glad to hear so much about Hans Kelsen here. <laughs> uh, as I said, uh, he's, he's really honored in Austria. And uh, I was very glad four years ago when I had the chance to uh, organize a monument in honor of Hans Kelsen um, next to his, uh, to his, to the house where he was born in Praha together with uh, my uh, Czech uh, colleague, the Minister of Justice there. So um, it's, uh, well, especially for, for the students here, I mean, if you study law, uh, it makes sense uh, to spend a short time to study the biography of Hans Kelsen. It pays, believe me, it pays, it will help you. So. Well, what about, uh, what is to say about our practical cases? I mean, uh, I can make it short. It's all about the European Convention uh, we are following very strictly in Austria. And uh, by the way, I think it really makes a big difference if a European country joined the Convention or not. And this has uh, um, practical uh, consequences, even for politics. When I was minister, I had to decide about um, extraditional 
cases, extradition. And uh, it was obvious and clear for me that uh, if a country asks for extradition, uh, the European country, which uh, did not join the European Convention of Human Rights, no way, I didn't. So even if it's uh, somehow very difficult to deal with countries that uh, are members of the Convention, I remember when I was uh, in Strasbourg uh, last time, two years ago, this was a time when uh, the Kurd received uh, about 300 complaints from Turkey each day. But the fact that uh, these countries accept an institution above them, this is better than they wouldn't. So I think it's very important to make this difference. Well, and uh, just to give you an example for practical decisions we recently had to take. Uh, last year, the court decided that marriage has to be open to people of the same gender too, in order to avoid discrimination. So we now have same-sex marriage in Austria. Prior to that, we had a so-called registered partnership for same-sex couples, which was recognized and accepted by the state, but uh, not have the same legal consequences as the traditional marriage. And the court had accepted the right of same-sex partners to adopt children before that. So the situation in Austria is quite the same as in 15 other member states of the European Union. So the majority of the European member states, they are now accepting same-sex marriage. Just recently, the Austrian Constitutional Court decided that no person can be forced to declare his gender if that person identifies as other than male or female. Decisions like that deal with individual freedom and aim to avoid discrimination. And we have a huge number of decisions dealing with equality. Since the principles of equality in Austria are a strong standard for legislation. And since 2013, Austrian citizens or residents can individually appeal to the Constitutional Court on the grounds that their fundamental rights of freedom, equality or dignity were violated. So we receive a high number of complaints because of this reason. Just recently, a complaint was lodged by a detained man who was convicted for a serious crime. And you have to know that in Austria's prisons, detainees are urged to work in prison in a various uh, sort of trades or professions. And this is very important for the re-socialization afterwards. And this man appealed to the Constitutional Court to have the right to form a union, a union to protect the rights of the working detainees. As you can imagine, the Court denied this demand since the rights of people in prison are very well guaranteed by law, in particular by the European Convention on Human Rights. There are naturally significant differences between the court decisions in Europe and in the United States, since the legal basis, the constitutional law is different. Therefore, Austria has a different approach to questions like separating kids of refugees or migrants from their parents which is strictly forbidden by Article 8 of the European Convention of Human Rights. Austria also has to handle the question how to treat people suspected of terrorism in a different way compared to the United States, according to the European Convention of Human Rights, which would not provide a legal basis for institutions such as Guantanamo. No way for Europe. So Austrians Constitutional Court also has to decide on a large number of complaints brought by migrants from countries like Pakistan, India, Afghanistan, Iraq or African countries who were determined not to have a right of asylum by lower courts. So this are on the whole the issues we are dealing with just now. Thank you so much. Justice Kennedy. Uh, prisons were mentioned, so let me confine my remarks to, to, to that, although it's a huge subject. 
uh, the legal profession for decades uh, was not interested in prisoners. We were fascinated with the guilt innocence process, um, how to try a case, uh, what the substantive criminal law was. Uh, once the appeal was over uh, and the key was taken away, the, the, the legal profession had no interest. Um, it, in my law school, we, I don't think we ever heard one word about the condition of prison and prisoners. Um, this simply, simply has, has, has to change. Uh, for, for years, for decades, uh, the medical profession knew a lot more about the conditions of prisoners and the problem of prison than the legal profession did. Um, it's difficult uh, to have a course in it. You don't make a lot of money out of representing prisoners. It's, it's hard to say that you're going to practice this area of the law, but the legal profession simply must do something about it. Uh, a few years ago, uh, California had close to 200,000 people in prisons. If you count that it's $30,000 a year per prisoner, that gets some people's attention. And if I have to take a monetary uh, concept in order to get people to think about the humanity, I'll, I'll, I'll settle to do that. Our prison terms are eight times longer than equivalent prison terms in uh, England and, 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 in, and in Western Europe for, for, the, for the same crime. Um, we have problems of solitary confinement. The numbers are not clear, but it seems that we may have as many as over 20,000 people in the United States in solitary confinement. Solitary confinement can drive men mad. One of the things in the military that some of us had to do, you were locked in a cage. Uh, to be forced to give your something more than name, rank, and serial number. And after six hours, uh, you think you were going to lose your mind. What about six days? What about six weeks? What about six years? Uh, there are little things. In, 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 in England, what they do as prisoners, and, and some are very dangerous and, 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 and have to be kept in special conditions, are in a semicircle so they can talk to each other. Little, little things like that. Uh, you, you, you mentioned. Um, in, 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 in your, your remarks, uh, just, Judge Powerford, uh, the, the idea of hope. Remember that uh, in, in Dante's Inferno, uh, when you entered the, the, the lowest level, it says, leave aside all hope, ye who enter here. This simply cannot be true in, in, in our prisons. We have held that it is unconstitutional uh, to sentence a juvenile to life in prison without parole. Uh, and, but this is just, just the beginning. Uh, and you might say, oh, I'm, we're, I'm, in civil, I'm, in, I'm in civil practice, I'm not in criminal practice. These prisons are yours. And this indignity and this injustice is yours. And I think uh, it's, it's very, very important uh, for us to focus on what's happening or what's not happening in American prisons. And I think it, it deserves observing that Justice Kennedy is the author of a five to four opinion upholding a three judge uh, decision in uh, federal district court in California uh, ordering uh, the release of, uh, of, of prisoners uh, because of prison overcrowding and deplorable uh, conditions including deplorable medical conditions. It was a controversial ruling, I think. Among many other decisions, Judge Kennedy deserves credit for that. Okay, well so now uh, we're entering the final phase of our program and it will be a bit of a lightning round. <laughs> but I want to say, uh, I want to thank everybody who submitted questions. We're certainly not going to be able to address all of them, but the Capital Center runs a blog called Cap Impact, and so I think we're going to take it upon ourselves to at least publish the questions that everybody asked, and so you'll be able to see that, and um, I certainly won't obligate anyone to provide answers, but I think it's important to have all your ideas out there. With that said, I have three selected questions, and I believe what I'm going to do is I will read all three of the questions. And then we'll give each justice the chance to choose which one uh, you would like to answer um, in the um, slightly less than 10 minutes we have left. So and number one, uh, from one of our pre-law students, who I believe is out in our satellite 
um, areas. Uh, was there ever a case where your personal ethics or moral system affected or threatened to affect your handling of a case? Okay, the second one is actually directed to Judge Power Ford, um, and it says in the introductions, it was stated that you emphasized children's rights in your work. In your opinions, in your opinions, what are the next steps that need to be taken in the national and international community to protect the rights of children? And the third question, what are your views on whether it's appropriate for judges to have life tenure? Is, would somebody like to go first, or the next one in line would be Justice Grodin? Well, I'll take question number one. Okay. Um, uh, we, we, have, we have this uh, myth, uh, which we, we, we trot out uh, every so often, that, that judges uh, are like referees, uh, calling balls and strikes and that this is a purely objective, neutral process that is unaffected by the person's background or by their moral values. And um, I, I don't know very many uh, lawyers or judges who would accept that as an accurate description uh, of what judging is about. Because many of our legal rules and certainly many of our constitutional principles embody values which require interpretation and reinterpretation. And so values and moral, moral judgments are in a way unavoidable uh, in the process certainly of constitutional jurisprudence. Uh, Benjamin Cardozo, who is a very wise man, uh, said this uh, more than a century ago, uh, but he also admonished that the, the values that a judge should bring to the decision of cases should not be his own personal idiosyncratic values, uh, but rather the values of the society, of the community as expressed in its legal documents and in prior judgments uh, and in the ethos of that society, and I think that that's true. But in answer to the question the way it is phrased, was there ever cases in which uh, my moral uh, uh, system, I think was the way the question was phrased, uh, affected uh, my decision in the case? Uh, and I would say, of course. Um, uh, and particularly with respect to constitutional issues, which doesn't mean uh, that, that I or any other judge would properly uh, uh, decide the case on the basis of that judge's notion of morality without regard uh, for the language of the Constitution or of the statute or legal precedents, uh, but rather that values are implicit <coughs> in the decision of judges in a democratic society. I'll, I'll, answer, I'll okay. answer the, the same question. It's a, a, a pre-law student. Uh, welcome to the law school. Uh, thank you for the easy question. Uh, <laughs> it's one of the hard, look at every judge, every day must ask himself, must ask herself, what is it that is impelling my decision? Why am I about to do this? And even if you've done it a hundred times, you still have to ask that question the hundred and first time because you have to know what it is that's driving your decision. Uh, are moral values important? Of course they are. But what's also important is a structure in which people can, ex can express their own moral values. Take the First Amendment. Uh, we have uh, opinions uh, which read as follows. Every book is as good as every other book. Every movie is as good as every other movie. I mean, is that really true? All we're saying is the government doesn't make that choice. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't make that choice. And the very fact the government doesn't make the choice 
means that you should be vigilant in, in defending your own moral values, your own taste. Let me guarantee you this. The next time you see a TV show or uh, uh, reviewing a book or reviewing a, a movie that's absolute junk, someone will say, oh, well, there's a First Amendment right. I know that. The point is it's junk. <laughs> and, and simply because there's a First Amendment right to do something doesn't mean that it's correct. You have your own moral values, and the citizen has to exercise those moral values as well as the judge. Thank you so much. Should I go to uh, Dr. Brandstetter, and then we'll yes. end since you have a question specifically directed to you. I just wanted to add that uh, since I'm a member of the Constitutional Court, I learned that uh, the strongest argument is the prior jurisdiction of our court. And uh, this is not so bad because uh, so we can be sure that not too much from our personal views are influencing the new decisions that have to be made. So in practice, well, I don't think that uh, the personal view um, has so much influence. And uh, by the way, that's what we learned from Hans Kelsen. <laughs> <laughs> Judge Powerford. I have to confess I'm probably the only judge here who's not a supporter of Hans Kelsen. <laughs> um, I'm not a, I, 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 in studying jurisprudence, he was very much presented as a positivist philosopher. Positive and uh, I think if you were to have a quick look at even one or two of my dissenting opinions, I, I'm not a positivist. But that said, I think judges have the obligation, of course, to comply with the law, to interpret the law. They cannot go off on a frolic of their own making up the law because that is not, uh, that is not serving the public in terms of legal certainty. They are bound to uphold the Constitution and the law. Um, that said, the Constitution and the laws need to be interpreted, and I suppose how they are interpreted by different judges uh, depends very much on the values, um, as you said, which judges bring to uh, the exercise of interpretation. But I've been asked a specific question, so I'll, I'll, I'll try to address that, and that is the question on children um, and children's rights. Um, I suppose, you know, the, the standard answer in the Strasbourg Court case law is that when a case involves a child, the overriding, the primary principle that a court must, decide, must um, bear in mind is the best interests of the child. Children, you know, we, we don't own our children. We have custody of them for a while, and within a very short time, they become the adults, you know, th that we have become uh, rather quickly. Um, and the court, I think, has gone some, has made some progress in terms of ensuring that we, we put the best interests of children first, um, most particularly in the area of the detention of unaccompanied minors. As, as um, uh, Dr. Brandstetter had mentioned earlier, there is a huge problem, a huge opportunity, if you like, in Europe at the moment with the influx of many people uh, who are fleeing persecution and war. And um, various attempts are, are, are being made to deal with this problem. Not all of them, I have to say, in my view, uh, successful. But one of the core principles which the court has confirmed is that it is unlawful to detain a child, to imprison a child, uh, particularly an unaccompanied minor. And where a child may need to be uh, kept in custody for the purposes of protecting that child, he or she must be, con must be kept in, a con in conditions which are appropriate to um, his age, um, and, 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 and so forth. And for example, a child must be given educational facilities if they are to be, uh, if they are to be kept in custody pending a decision as to, as to what or where they, what is to be done or where they must go. Uh, so I think the Strasbourg Court has made some progress um, in this regard. Um, it has also uh, emphasized that when dealing with children in courts, they must have conditions available to them which enable them to participate effectively in proceedings. And this was confirmed considerable time ago in a case uh, T and V versus the United Kingdom. T and V were two juveniles who had kidnapped a, a little boy as he was leaving, as he was in a supermarket with his mother. And they had subjected this two-year-old child to the most horrendous death. Um, and they were tried in a prison, they were tried in British courts 
and they were convicted and found guilty, but they complained through their lawyers to the Strasbourg court that they hadn't received a fair trial because they were treated as if they were adults. They were brought into the witness box, the judges and the lawyers had their wigs and gowns on, and, and they didn't have the kind of supports which children, um, which children require. And the court found a violation of Article 6 in that case um, because it confirmed that for a child to participate effectively in criminal proceedings, they need other supports which adults don't need. So, for example, the presence of a counsellor or a social worker uh, who would explain to them in the language that they understand what is happening. Um, judges and, and lawyers don't wear their wigs when they're talking to the children. Um, in other words, they try to take away the intimidation of the courtroom. And uh, these, these uh, are important protections, I think, in terms of children's participation. Um, I think for the future, I think the question was, what are the next steps that we might need to take? Um, I think there is work to be done in developing the law in relation to the bullying of children through uh, the internet. I think cyberbullying um, and the suicides that, that often result from that amongst the young population, I think that's really um, a pressing problem in a number of countries. And I think uh, consideration needs to be given as to how we can better protect our children um, when they are dealing with, with the internet. Um, even though, of course, there is the obligation to ensure that the right to free speech is protected. But getting that balance right, particularly when vulnerable children uh, uh, are an issue, I think that's probably the next uh, great challenge, or at least one of them. Thank you. May I take 30 seconds to add a postscript to my previous Certainly. statement? Certainly. Uh, so that it is not misinterpreted. Um, uh, if it is, if it is uh, a myth, uh, that judges are simply referees calling balls and strikes. Uh, I think it is equally a myth that judges are nothing but legislators in disguise. And I fear that in the present climate in the United States in particular, we have come to regard the courts in such political terms that we've lost sight of the constraints which every judge feels and which every judge on this panel has articulated uh, that, that constrains judges within the law, within the values of the society and, uh, uh, and, and, not, and not acting as a free agent to develop policies that they think would be desirable. Thanks. Judging is a delicate balance. <laughs> Thank you so much. And with that, uh, I'm going to say thank you to all of our judges for being with us tonight. It's been an interesting program and all sorts of things that could have been said if we had more time, but we do not. Um, and so I want to ask all of you to please remain seated um, as the judges exit to the, um, I guess, my left. And I want to remind you also that we have our reception out those doors waiting for you and I hope you're able to go there and enjoy some uh, food and good company. Thank you for being with us. Thank you.